Patty Haidu is Canada's Minister of Health. She is with me now. Uh, Minister Haidu, thanks for your time tonight. Uh, good to speak with you. It's good to see you again. Great to be with you, Peter. It has been a demanding, uh, emotional, and I'm sure exhausting past year for you and a large team of uh, people who support you at Health Canada. So I, 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 let's start with the past year. What, what sort of thoughts are running through your head? What are you thinking tonight as, as we mark this one-year anniversary of, of this pandemic? Well, I think, first of all, I, my thoughts, and I've been thinking about it all day long, um, really all year long, as you point out, it's just the extraordinary sacrifices that Canadians have made for one another. I mean, uh, people have obviously lost loved ones to COVID-19, but also Canadians have stayed home. They've uh, foregone earnings. They've changed the way that they work. They've uh, gone without seeing family and friends for a very long time. They've helped each other out. Uh, they've 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 uh, you know put off travel sometimes for what would seem like very important reasons, mm -hmm. and and they've let go of many of the celebrations of life. And so it's it's been a hard year for Canadians. It's been a hard year for global citizens. But obviously, as Canada's health minister, my heart's with my my fellow Canadians. What do you think, looking back? What, what's worked really well in Canada's response? I get asked this question all the time, and I, I, you know, I think the story's not written yet in terms of what's worked well and what hasn't worked well. And um, I don't know, um, you know, when this will happen, but I think that international study and that national review of what was uh, what worked well and what what didn't, both here in Canada and around the world, is a really important piece of work. Mm. But I feel like we're in the middle still, and it's hard to answer that question. I do know one thing that's worked that worked really well early on, and that was our, I think, very bold decision to change financial programs extremely quickly to help uh, keep people from financial despair as they made those really hard decisions to stay home and to furlough their businesses and their employees. And I think those economic measures saved lives. What about the uh, the cross political response, if I can put it that way? Uh, satisfied for the most part, and particularly how the federal government and the provinces have uh, sort of had to not often at cross purposes, but from time to time, yes. Uh, about how that relationship has worked. Well, we live in a federation, and it's almost like thirteen small. Uh, countries, if you will, jurisdictions of healthcare delivery, that, that has made it challenging at times because, of course, we have a Canada Health Act, but uh, after that, provinces and territories have the full, <clears throat> the full jurisdiction and authority to deliver health care and, in fact, the responsibility to deliver health care to their own citizens. But we worked really, really well together by, by and large. And, you know, the federal government um, and my colleagues and I uh, in cabinet decided early on that it was important that we support the provinces and territories in this most important work and that it wasn't the time to quibble about who paid for what. And so, of course, as you know, the federal government, uh, we've borne the large portion of the uh, economic cost of responding to the pandemic and we continue to do so for provinces and territories because uh, in our minds, it was about pulling together as a country, supporting Canadians through this really difficult time. You, you say in large measure, the, the story mm -hmm. is yet to be written about what really worked and what didn't work. But I, I think we know where uh, some of the failures have been. And, and to some extent, it, it, if there have been failures, they were uh, sometimes caused by where we were as a country. Uh, you know, successive governments, the dismantling of the pandemic early warning system, lack of vaccine manufacturing capability in Canada, a pandemic plan that was never fully tested. We've seen thousands of deaths in the long-term care homes. And I'm, you know, uh, how racialized Canadians have been affected and women have been affected and harder hit by the pandemic than other groups. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, looking ahead, how is your government planning to take those lessons and build a more resilient pandemic response for the next time around? Well, I think there's no question about the need, and I said this early on, to have bold investments in public health agencies across the country, at the federal level, obviously, but also at the provincial level, to ensure that we're doing the things that public health is really good at doing, both protecting health and preventing illness. And those two things go hand in hand in any public health agency. Um, it's public health is, a, you know, the sort of poor cousin of direct health care delivery. And I worked in public health for nine years, Peter, as you know, um, it's a fraction of most health care budgets. And yet they prevent so much illness and they protect Canadians against infectious diseases on a regular basis, including things like inspecting 
um, restaurants and service industry providers mm -hmm. like nail salons and hair salons and helping with uh, ensuring vaccination. And all of that work often goes unseen, but I think the pandemic has elevated the work of public health in a way that we haven't seen in a very long time. L let me raise with you a couple of specific things looking forward here. Uh, vaccinations are ramping up, uh, clearly a good thing. Still lots of concern around uh, the spread of variants and, and what that might mean for uh, successive waves and next waves. But let me ask about vaccine passports, proof of immunization that might facilitate international travel and free movement in Canada. And I know the government science advisor is preparing a report on vaccine passports and whether Canada should adopt them as some other countries are doing. What are the issues at play here and whether or not to implement vaccine passports? Right. Well, on the one hand, if the world, if the international community moves towards a proof of vaccination as an ability to enter um, countries and for, from an international travel perspective, it's very important that Canada understand what those um, those international requirements might be. And in fact, we, we know there are countries that ask for proof of immunization of other infectious diseases now. It's very important that Canada continue to be at the table in those conversations. But of course, on the other hand, um, there are all kinds of equity issues when we start talking about access to vaccines. For example, we know that uh, wealthier countries have had more rapid access, that there are other reasons why people might not be vaccinated, and, and those can be challenges in terms of equity. And so these are very uh, difficult uh, questions mm -hmm. to answer. And I know the entire global community is grappling with how to restore international travel in a way that's safe for, for everyone. Okay. Um... Let me ask you about, uh, and, I'm, and I'm, you, you may have had some discussion about this today, AstraZeneca, concerns in Europe, some countries uh, suspending the use after reports of blood clots in some patients. I know we, get a, we have a different batch of our AstraZeneca uh, supply for this country, but uh, how concerned do we need to be about uh, those concerns about AstraZeneca in this country? You know, our regulators are not worried about the batches and doses of AstraZeneca that we're receiving here in Canada. It is indeed that different. And uh, the, the Health Canada regulators have carefully reviewed not just the data on the vaccine itself, but where it's manufactured, indeed, right down to the lot or batch, as you refer to it. And so we're uh, confident. Uh, in the safety of AstraZeneca. And I will say also that part of the regulatory approval is the constant review of uh, adverse effects um, internationally, but certainly Canada-wide and provinces and territories regularly report uh, adverse effects up to the federal government as they do with any other vaccine, by the way, so that we can monitor the safety of those vaccines live time. I got a, less than a minute left here, but I want to give you the opportunity to answer this question. I mean, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty still ahead of us. Um, you know, uh, and, and, and it's perhaps an awkward question, but uh, like, how will you know when we've won, in, in your view, mm -hmm. how will you know when we've won the fight against COVID-19? What, what will it look like? Well, I think what it'll look like is that when we do begin to cautiously reopen parts of our uh, society that have been really challenging to reopen, like restaurants and uh, movie theaters and other, you know, uh, congregate sort of areas where people come together in big crowds. And we are able to do that with the degree of uh, safety and a feeling of safety, then we'll know that we've beat back COVID-19. And, you know, that will take everybody getting vaccinated when your chance and your time arrives. It will also take making sure that we stay on any outbreak of COVID-19 as it arises and that we continue to really have our mind focused on protecting the most vulnerable in our communities, strengthening our workplace protections, strengthening our long-term care homes to ensure that everyone has the, the infection prevention control training and the supports needed to keep all of those settings safe. Health Minister Patty Haidu, uh, thanks for your time this evening. Take care. Thank you very much, Peter.